thing I would like to talk to you, with you is about um, your childhood. You were born in Malaysia, right? Yes. Uh, how is that? <laughs> <laughs> My father was a doctor in the British Army. All right. And uh, they had a they had a very exciting life. My parents because they went everywhere. We went to like North diplomats, Africa, like diplomats. Yeah. I went to. We were in Libya just before Gaddafi, Libya. presumably. Um, we, I was born in Malaya, my brothers were born in Hong Kong, we lived in Singapore, I remember <laughs> Singapore very well, loved Singapore, I've always loved Singapore and Malaya, um, and then Germany, it was just one of those things, I mean nowadays in the British Army you don't go anywhere really, but um, in those days you went all around the world, so it was the last bit of the British Empire, I suppose. Right. So that's why, um, yeah, that's why I was born And were they there. close to art, or? To art? Yeah. Dad was, um, and still is, he's still doing it, a fantastic musician okay. and singer. And he, um, to explain my childhood, I was trained as a chorister uh, in St. Paul's Cathedral, which is just around the corner from where we're talking, so, which is London's big cathedral. And um, Dad was there before me. And the thing about that training is that um, it's the most fantastic musical training at the age of right. seven. Seven years old. So yeah. by the time you're eight, you can read music and sight read anything and oh my all God. that. So dad had that training, and then so did I. But it meant that he, he sung all his life, and he's conducted, and he's... Yeah, so it was music. Music was the big And thing. your mother? My mother um, wasn't a musician. Um, she was the most wonderful woman, but she was, wasn't a musician. And I found out years later that she used to listen to Olivier doing <laughs> Amulet on a record <laughs> in her bedroom. But it was, we weren't a theatre going family particularly, except for opera. Exactly. Dad and Mum would go to opera. But, uh, and we, when was it the first time you saw a play, an actual theatre? Um, I think probably the first one I can remember going to was vaguely Midsummer Night's Dream in the outdoor theatre here in London, in Regent's Park. Uh, but I don't really have much. Um, you remember to enjoy that, yeah. or is it? Uh, it was quite fun. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't part of. Uh, we weren't a literary family in that way, and um, and certainly Shakespeare wasn't a part of our lives at all. Um, as I say, it was all music and very intense music. I mean, very sort of competitive within the family. Really? Music, yeah. But we were all competitive. <laughs> three three boys and a girl. You know. Uh, but no, I, the Shakespeare and literature didn't really. That was my discovery. <laughs> really? Yeah. And, and, I mean, and on, well, on when that happened? Well, that happened at school. And I is it true that your first role was Desdemona? Well, not entirely <laughs> true. <laughs> but that is quite. When weird. I was a chorister, when I was at school, as a chorister, my first actual role was Hippolyta. All right. <laughs> in Midsummer Night's Dream. But then I went out, when I went to big school when I was thirteen, there was this particular English teacher who went, um, uh, I think you're an actor, yeah. and I think you're a Shakespearean, a Shakespeare lover. And uh, he was right, and I fell in love with Shakespeare. He gave me Desdemona to do, and of course Desdemona sings at the end of Othello. And I think the real reason was that he thought, oh, Was it your voice? Well, I think he thought, you know, at least we're safe on the song, you know, <laughs> make you this point, yeah. um, Desdemona. But it was, um, that was a major, major thing. And then he, for the rest of my school time, he, oh, li literature became... He was like your mentor in a way? Yeah, or? absolutely. Yeah. He was the most, I don't really see him much now, but I, I, I think he knows <laughs> that he was the most fundamentally important teacher in my life and in other people's lives. He's, wow. um, there's a director called, film director called, and theatre director called Roger Michel, who did these like Notting Hill and yeah, and uh, just opened a show at the National recently called Consent. He was his mentor as well, so he was one of those people who just had had the gift, had the gift of inspiring people. Amazing. And then my last months at school, when I was seventeen, he said, "Let's do King Lear." So, so I did Lear when I was seventeen. Seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> And how did you, how did you start with with the, the training as an actor? Where, where, well, then where you see, of happen? course, I, I went I went to university and then came to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, which again is literally just around the corner from here. 
um, uh, as a singer, as a musician. As a singer. Yeah. Because it was so much, so much in my in my blood. Music. It was like sort of that's what I always. Either that or being a doctor, like my parents. Exactly. And um, I didn't do medicine at university, so I ended up thinking, oh, I'd better be a singer. Um, and then halfway through my training as a singer, uh, I thought, hang on, I'm in the wrong job. I was a terrible singer, too. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. But I thought, I'm in the wrong job. I need to do Shakespeare and uh, acting. So I changed. And Shakespeare, my, Shakespeare he, he got his own music, so uh, it's like... Well, yeah. well, people ask me about that, and I never consciously think about that, but I wonder whether there is something about, about rhythm and yeah. um, that a musical training is very useful. I don't know, I don't know. But I do remember my father going, oh, thank goodness you decided to be an actor, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> Was he aware that yeah. you... Yeah. Were, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think they were relieved. Do you have to fight against that or not? No, not at all. Honestly, I, I phoned up and said, Dad, I think I want to be an actor. He said, oh, thank God. All right. So there wasn't any, any issue about that at all. And, and your, your training as an actor, was it kind of a, a method training, like more from no. inside to outside, more well, physical training? To How be was that? perfectly honest, I left the guild all early. Really? So I didn't complete my training. Um, I think, I think we all now do method whether we know it or not. I mean, whether, whether it's strict method um, uh, or whether it's just, just the, it's, it's, in the, it's, in the, it's in the ether with actors, isn't it? Uh, that, that's the way you approach parts, a sort of emotional recollection. And, but in fact, probably the most useful thing I ever, I ever used was actually from my study of literature at university. So study of structure and right. um, language and uh, more drier things actually. So that you have a, have a big thing about um, with Shakespeare that you, when I, when I, in the rare occasions when I teach, I say to my pupils, it's it's what the character is thinking rather than feeling. And if you do, if you do the thought first, and it takes longer than you think, and it's harder than you think, to get a precise thought, then the, the emotional life will follow. So, um, and that approach is for every character. I or think, do you, yeah, yeah, I think yes, because just because. Um, what can I? Oh, I'll give an example. Uh, Prosper, right at the beginning of the Tempest, which I'm doing at the moment, hmm. he's, he builds the storm, and then he, it's a very simple thing, but he says to Ariel, are they safe? Which <laughs> presumably right. means that they might not be safe, which therefore right. means that the play starts with Prosper thinking... This is a little bit worry about, yeah. yeah. Right. In which case the emotional life becomes different from being the great... Exactly, um, yeah. ...magician. Yeah, right. So you start off in a different place. And I think that's a very simple example, but I mean, there's whole, whole, you know, whole areas of things like Hamlet's madness. And I suddenly thought, actually, Hamlet, I don't see much evidence of him being mad. Everybody else says he's mad, but he, he doesn't look really mad at all. <laughs> he's a great actor. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, so, you know, what I'm saying is it leads yeah. you, if you work out what characters think it'll lead you into areas that are unexpected i think all right and and, and uh, do you like in in your warm-up um before every show you just um, well pass actually, it by all this or it's just like actually i i tend to do the whole part very quickly all right so embarrassingly hamlet takes an hour <laughs> the performance is three and a half <laughs> but you can right. do the whole of hamlet in that uh, yes, yeah, so I'll run through the whole thing okay. very quickly. I mean, it's, it's not really um, very complicated. I just go through the whole. All right. So I write, I write down uh, some of the plays you were involved. Do you, would you like to? Go on, to go go on. I mean, just the classics you've done, and that's uh, Chekhov three times. Uh, uh, Vanya Siegel, the Cherry Orchard. Uh, Ibsen, Ben Jonson twice, Marlowe, Stoppard, Gorky, Pinter twice. Well, David Hare, Galileo, Brecht, kind of, yeah. 
And you've been also at the Royal Ballet. Yes. Doing Alice in Wonderland. Much to my surprise. <laughs> Yeah. Not dancing or yes? yeah, no dancing. Uh, yeah, really. Yeah, how was that? I, well, I did a play, and I was in the, the character of the play was one of the stupidest men I've ever played. He was fantastic. He was an absolute idiot, and um, that's the snake skin. Yeah, I was playing this absolute idiot, and this choreographer called Chris Wilder, a very famous British choreographer, came and saw it because he was a friend of the director. Anyway, a couple of right. weeks later, I got this phone call saying, would you like to be in my version of Alice in Wonderland to dance the Duchess? And I said, well, I can't dance. I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, and in the part, I'd done some sort of fake ballet. You know? All right. I said, but if you think I can do it, then okay. So I went and he said, at the very first day, he said to the ballet mistress, he said, I want this guy to be dancing. I don't want him to be an actor with dancers. I want him to be a dancer. So we were so, involved like in a yeah, the reality class. show. You, yeah, you need to exactly. learn how like to dance. Dancing, you know, <laughs> yeah. dancing. dancing yeah. with the stars yeah. or something. So every day I did class and I didn't do the, everything in class, but I, mean, I did the, the basics of class and yeah. And I was wow. terrible, but. Um, but it's supposed was, to be funny. Yes, it's supposed to be funny. <laughs> um, but it was, I mean, it was the most extraordinary experience because I was surrounded by. You know, they are different creatures, ballet dancers. I mean, they're just, yeah, you know, they're yes, just they breathtaking. Are. And I was there, you know, and I was twice the size of any of them. And <laughs> and I was trying to do my ballet, and um, and I wasn't. Did happy. someone have to raise you or something? It's like lift me, no. <laughs> not lift you. Oh, did they? No, they didn't. Um, but it was such a privilege. <laughs> Three months I spent training, and um, and. Uh, as I say, I wasn't, I don't think I was very good, but I, the proudest moment of my life virtually was when I was given the, you know, the little card to get into the building saying Sun yeah. Hustleville Ballet Company. And I thought, who would have thought? <laughs> really? And there I was, yeah. And you find any difference between that audience and the regular theatre Shakespearean audiences? Not in the audience. I did, I mean, it was interesting that he, Chris, I think, would have said he hired me for as a, for my acting, obviously not for my dancing, but for my acting, he thought that would be the bit that I will find easy. In fact, funnily enough, that was the really hard bit. Really? Because I, as an actor, I don't use my body as in that way. I don't, so to be able to say, I hate you as a, yeah, exactly. in a ballet, in a way that you would never do it. There's another language. Yes, yeah. another language. Yeah. Another acting language. So that was the difficult bit, funnily enough. Wow. In the, the, the steps were just about <laughs> slogging away and doing it every day. But the, it was the, the acting that was the difficult bit. Wow, amazing. And I, I wrote down as well all the Shakespeare oh. you've done. Well, it's quite a lot. What well, Othello, shall we say, twice. The Desdemona. Oh, and yes, Desdemona, yes. <laughs> that great Desdemona. Troilus and Cressida. Mm -hmm. Richard III. Mm -hmm. The Tempest, twice. Well, Twelfth Night, Lear twice, Edgar and Lear. Three times at school. Three times? Ah, school, really? <laughs> that's, that's right, that's right. Timon, Winter's Tale, Falstaff for the Hollow Crown mm -hmm. TV series. And then in the year 2004, you performed the same year, Hamlet, Macbeth, and uh, you've been in Julius Caesar as that well. the same year. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, well, well <laughs> Is there any part that you would like to perform and you still um, didn't? I sort of, and I love doing false stuff on film, but I, I'm, I quite like to do that on stage, I think. Mm. Uh, they're such wonderful plays, the Henry Ford plays. And, um, you missed Romeo and Juliet. <sighs> you don't like it? Yeah? What can I say? <laughs> yes, of course. It's not my favourite. Yeah. Um, although, although, fun enough, Derek Jacobi, famous British actor, yeah. has just done Mercutio, hasn't he? It's 70. Um, yes, the ones that I, I... I would quite like to, to revisit some. I wasn't very happy with my, my bear. 
Why um, was it? Was it? I don't. Well, I had a really firm idea about it, and that's always a bad idea to go to rehearsal with a very firm idea, because <laughs> right. although I still believe in it, which is um, oh, it's complicated. It's to do with it's to do with um, Macbeth becoming. Oh, it's very difficult to explain. It's to do with time. It's to do with the fact that he ends up completely uh, in stasis at the end, absolutely motionless, because he can't look at the future and he can't look at the past. And it's to do with children and kill, all the killing of the children. Yeah. That he wants to get rid of the future. He, he doesn't. It, it's a very strange place he ends up with, unlike any of the other tragic heroes. I think he ends up in a place of. If I'm, if I don't move, it'll be all right somehow. If I don't move, um, yeah. But the, the other, I'd like to do Leo again uh, one day, and uh, and there are a couple, which is the second uh, King John, uh, not particularly interested in Shylock. I, I don't, I don't know why. I just. Don't. And all the, the all these like c career you've done with Shakespeare, was it planned or is it just no. like? It happens? No, I've never planned anything. Why do you think they call you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we know because you're a great actor, but why do you I, think... I don't know, I don't know. I think, fun enough, you mentioned the three Chekhovs, which have been, all of them, major experiences in my life. And the first one, when I was young, Seagull, which was with the Royal Shakespeare Company, where I'm working now, and I'd been a comic actor, and then suddenly one of the directors said, I'd like you to play Constantine in The Seagull. And that changed their attitude of me, but also my attitude to myself, I think. All right. Playing um, a very sad man. And it was a wonderful production that Terry Hans did, and it was, it, that changed, yeah, changed everything, I think. And then I. I said, oh gosh, well I suppose, you know, one day I could do Hamlet, or like, um, yeah. it did cross my mind, you know. but I've never planned it, I don't, I don't know why they call it. And go, going to Hamlet, you, you, you said he's, that you believe that he's not mad, what is he, is he sad uh, because of uh, uh, look, his the, father's death, is he sad because he's not the king, because his mother knew uh, uh, marriage, or... Uh, when I say he's not mad, it's, it's perfectly valid to play him mad, uh, pretending to be mad. But he himself says, I'm mad north northwest. You know. <laughs> I'm fat mad. Um, and I, when I was doing it, I didn't, the reason why I say it, I didn't know what to do with madness. I didn't know how to represent madness. Um, and as you know, Shakespeare tends to, when he's writing mad people, he tends to use a different type of language, doesn't he? So yeah. Ophelia, famously, or poor Tom in Lear. Or he doesn't do that with Hamlet. Hamlet, except for one tiny scene with Polonius, never really does that sort of quirky, yeah. mad language. So I was, you know, thinking, uh, is, he, well, so is he mad? And the thing is, it's Polonius who first says he's mad. And I thought, well, Polonius is hardly a very good judge of anybody. Um, <coughs> So I thought, okay, well, what if he's not mad? What if he's grief, just grief-stricken? And uh, I think there's more. I think there's more dissatisfaction with the world that he can't place. But I wonder whether it's my my hand that was grief. It was, right. wasn't madness. It was grief. But uh, grief um, is a type of madness, you know. You, the, in a way, you know, you lose your mind, and you think you lose your mind. My mother had just died before I did it. I literally a month before I did it. So it was, I was, it was very, it was very formal. Uh, how did you handle Hamlet's, <coughs> re Hamlet's relationship with women, well, with your personal yeah. um, history then? So it was like... Well, I remember thinking uh, that how amazing in a way to be given the chance to do the greatest meditation on grief ever written when you're grieving. And it was a horrible, it was a horrible period of all my family's life and um, uh, and but it was like a gift to her um, 
as, as you quite rightly point out, his attitude to women. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real weak, weak yeah. point with Hamlet. But I didn't associate that with my mum, actually, funny enough. I associated my mum with, with the ghost of my father. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, but I decided that this Hamlet loved his father. They had a, they had a good rela you know, a good relationship. Not so, a, you, so you were with 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 your personal background. It's not like because it's like it's painful in a way, right? Well, to, doing Hamlet. I yeah. Think, yes. Yeah. But it was a gift. It was a, it was a gift to her. Yeah. So you turn it into kind of positive. Uh, well, I remember on, on the on. The, you know, we have in this country, as you know, we have, I don't know, it's the same with you, but we have, you know, that, the press night, the night when everyone comes, and it's always very nerve wracking. And, yeah. And I remember thinking when I did the press night, oh, I don't give a damn. I really don't care. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, I mean, well, normally yeah. I get nervous, but I remember <sighs> there, are yeah. more, there are more important things in the world. Yes, there are. Yes, there like are. Like your parents dying or yeah, your children yeah, yeah. dying or whatever. And uh, uh, this is just simply, this is my public gift. You know, she allowed me to do this. She supported me. She created me. There you go. That's there you go, that's yeah. What it is. So, uh, it was, as you say, it was a sadness that was turned perhaps into something, something positive. Did, did, did you find difficult uh, creating Leah because of the madness uh, sort of thing going on? Yes, I, I, uh, I used my medical family to... Really? I, I've used them quite a lot. <laughs> and every time I have a sort of problem, I, you know, I fed up my sister who's a G, um, GP general practitioner, and go, oh, what, what's your reaction if you, I don't know, faint or you know, whatever, whatever the part requires. And this one, I, I, uh, my nephew, who's now in his mid-twenties, young doctor, and I said, Ben, can you look up uh, dementia for me? Right. And, uh, and King Lear and see if there's any, anybody's written anything. And lo and behold, um, yeah, there was lots of stuff about it. Lots of stuff, yeah. And I thought, oh, I, um, I just thought with Lear that it, it was quite accurate. Shakespeare's writing is very accurate. It was like he'd observed somebody suffering from dementia, you know. Um, the hallucinations, the forgetting the words, the, you know, all those traits of, of ageing. And I thought, well, let's use it. Let's find out. I've never done this before with a Shakespeare play. I've never gone outside yeah. and brought something in. But I thought, this is interesting. I, I, uh, then I had friends who were suffering dementia and um, watching them. Uh, and interesting things like him getting small, literally smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So if you watch the play, I get smaller. <laughs> a little, <laughs> tiny little man at the end. Uh, which I'd seen happen. Um, so all those, all those things were fed into it. But I think it was. A, I think I was certainly aware that Shakespeare was doing something rather sort of like rather medical, really. I think he was charting what he'd yeah. seen somebody do. I don't know. Yeah, and there's a great relationship there with uh, one of uh, his uh, daughters, right? Yes, I. <clears throat> <clears throat> I was very keen to not sentimentalize him. Like Falstaff, I was very keen not to sentimentalize Falstaff. But I think um, uh, Lear's a very unpleasant man, mm. a very violent man, probably even abusive, not sexually, but yeah. you know. <clears throat> To his daughters, and I think when Cordelia and him meet at the end of the play, I didn't see it as again. This is a brilliant piece of observation by Shakespeare. Their first meeting, <clears throat> which we set in a sort of hospital bed, was absolutely that of a young woman coming to see her ill parent. It, it, it had the same mixtures of embarrassment and yeah. and uh, and then brilliantly the scene ends with um, Cordelia saying, should we go for a walk? 
in the AGS of care findings. And I thought that's absolutely what happens in hospitals, isn't it? You yeah, just it happened go, to all of I us. I can't yeah. talk to you. I can't. I'm. Let's share something. Let's just, let's just go for a walk yeah. and just breathe, get a, some fresh air, and and, and I thought. It, rather than it being forgiveness and a reconciliation, it was the beginning of a forgiveness and a reconciliation. Yeah. It was nowhere near there. And what is so heartbreaking about the play is that, of course, it never does because she dies. And any possibility, they haven't made it up. I, I, it breaks my heart. Yeah. They haven't made it up. They, they could have done with a bit of work, but they, they don't make it. Um, and it's very, very bleak indeed. And now you're working in Prospera, which also have a, a very strong relationship with, with, his, with daughter. his daughter. Well, I found Prospera a very, very emotional experience. Um, I didn't think it would be. I've done it when I did it before. We did a beautiful production at the RSC. With, with the past of the years, do you change uh, your point yeah, of view? Yeah, I think so. And I think also... Do, do with Lear, or, because you're, you're yeah. getting older, so yeah. it's like... Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. So there I was a very young Ariel, not really young Ariel, but I was a younger man doing Ariel, and it was cool, and it was cheap. <laughs> and, it yeah. was, and the play itself was rather sort of remote and polished, beautiful, like a Duke, like an Elizabethan jewel, you know. Um, but this time, I'm, 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 I find it extremely distressing. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. I think it's a high, I think the man is, like everybody of my age, just beginning to go, this is it, this is, this is, I need to, I need to assess my own life, you know, and I think that's what Prospero is being forced to do. Basically, Prospero is a control freak who has no control. Exactly. So everything, everything that he plans doesn't go as he expected it to. He was expecting them to, all the, the, his brother and the, the king of Naples to go, oh, how marvellous to see you again, forgive us. And he goes, I forgive you. And, yeah. and with his daughter, she was the most amazing bit in the play when she proposes to Ferdinand, the man she's fallen in love with, um, without his permission. Um, I mean, he's spying. He sees her do it. I think he's thinking, <laughs> what is going on? What's going on? She's proposing <laughs> to him. I haven't given her permission to do that. And it's a way. Anyway, yeah. basically, therefore, the play is a lot about losing his daughter. Yeah. And, and there's, no, there's no mention of your of uh, Prospero's wife. One. One only. One mention. What happened? Oh, is she know. dead? Is she alive in she, Naples? As what you, is it? As you well know, Shakespeare isn't great at mothers. Yeah. He's so, not great at wives, actually. Well, there's so many. Yeah. There's so many father daughters. And father brothers, daughters, yeah. Obsessed with brothers betraying each other. Obsessed with father daughter relationships. Yeah. But, um, but the mothers, yeah. Mothers, yeah. No. Weird, isn't it? Well, let, let me do just uh, one little game we, we cr kind of created with you, and it's like I'm going to say one word. And one word. One word, and you have to reply with another one. Oh, but but you cannot repeat it. So if you say one word, you, then you cannot repeat it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it? First one is love. Oh, um, I was about to say lust. Which I <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's yeah. okay. Um, childhood. Bed. I just say the first word that comes into my head. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Shakespeare. Oh, <laughs> I was going to play orange, but I don't know why I want to say orange. This is some psychological, you know, it's some hideous profile of me. Uh, oh, Shakespeare, I can't think of anything of Shakespeare. He's too big. Too big. Okay, two. Um, death. Church. Now, isn't that interesting? Because I'm not, I don't think I've got a faith. Church. Critics. Oh, love and joy. <laughs> England. Green. And now you can say three words. I'm going to say Simon Russell Beale. Oh, I don't know, 
bit of a mess. Bit a a bit of a mess. That's fine, isn't it? I'm a bit of a mess. A bit of a mess. Well, Simon, thank you very much <laughs> for having us. It was my Thank pleasure. You. Thank you.